The message you're about to listen to is brought to you by the Enthronement House Christian Center, a church with the mandate to activate and actualize God's royalty in you. Fasten your seatbelt, get ready for a ride as God's servant brings you the anointed word of God that will change your life forever. And now, the ministry of the senior pastor, Enthronement Assembly, Reverend Deji Olabode. In Zechariah chapter 8, verse 12 to verse 13, I'll read and then we'll work. The Bible says, For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give its fruit, the ground shall give her increase, the heavens will give their due, and I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. And it shall come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so I will save you and you shall be a blessing. Do not fear, let your hands be strong. The second scripture without Genesis 8 of verse 22, while the earth remains, Seed time, harvest, cold and eat, winter and summer, day and night, shall not cease. Speaking briefly on the law of seed time, harvest, part two. The law of seed time, harvest, part two. Let us pray. Father, we humble ourselves before you. We're asking, O God, for an eternal deposit of your word on the lives of your people today. I'm asking that you honor me with utterance in the name of the Lord Jesus. Honor our dear people with entrance in the name of the Lord Jesus. Confound the understandings and the revelations that will be imparted into the consciousness of your people today. The undeniable signs among this following. We will vow to give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And somebody says, Amen. It is our month of uncommon prosperity but i established my first session that people just don't prosper zachariah chapter 8 verse 12 tells us that the seed the seed shall be prosperous so in the absence of a seed the question the, the prosperity may be in question he now said the seed will be prosperous the vine will give its fruit the ground will give her increase the heaven will give her due, and I will cause the remnant. It didn't say everybody will possess it. Right? I will cause the remnant of those people to possess all those things. And I'm praying this month, you will be the remnant. That if anybody will possess prosperity this month, it will be you. In the name of the Lord Jesus. That my God will make you that remnant. What I call the possessing remnant. In the name of the Lord Jesus. He said in Obadiah, upon Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. Upon Mount Zion there shall be holiness. He says, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. I'm praying that in the name of Jesus, this month you will possess. You will possess. You will possess your possession in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Then in Genesis 18, it says, While this earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. In the morning, I was sharing with you that we must be the kind of people who live by principles and not by presumption. One of those principles that is as valid as the existence of the earth is what the Bible calls the law of seed, time, and harvest. When I was young and I first came to an awareness of this law, I used to use it as a basis of my faith for not dying because when I was young, I had this fear of probably dying young or dying before my time because the rascally things I'd done in my past. When I came across this scripture, to me, my faith was anchored on that scripture that I, so if I, if as long as the earth remains, seed, time and harvest shall not cease, then if I keep sowing seeds, God will prolong my life to be able to reap the harvest. Well, it was a strong basis of my faith. Then later I saw Gideon the speaker in Isaiah 53. He said, he shall see his seed and prolong his days. He shall see his seed and prolong his days. 
So seeds also can bring about certain dimensions of longevity. He shall see his seed and prolong his day. In Psalm 22, he says, A seed shall serve him. I think verse 30 or thereabouts. A seed shall serve him, and it shall be counted for a generation. So seeds are important. And in Genesis 8.22 says, As long as this earth remains, there is a guarantee that seed, time, and harvest shall not cease. Hallelujah. And so I remember sharing with you this, uh, that it's important in Job chapter 38 and verse 33 that we know the laws of heaven so that we can establish his dominion upon the earth. One of such laws, ladies and gentlemen, is the law of seed time and harvest. And I expanded this in the life of a man called Jacob. How that a seed of the deception into the life of his father led to a harvest of deception all through his life. His children deceived him. His concubine deceived him. His wife deceived him. His boss are you there? Deceived him. His life was one defined by the seed he had sown. Listen to me. Your life will be defined by the kind of seeds that you're sown. My life will be defined by the kind of seeds that I'm sowing. If you're going to have a quality life, you're going to have to learn what it means to sow quality seeds. Quality seeds. Today, I no longer worry about my future. All I do is to pack the right seeds into my present. And my, my seeds will answer in the future. There's something in the world. Whatever you put out will come back. And I'm going to deal with this later. Whatever you put out will come back. How it comes back is something I don't understand. It's a dynamic, not only in the kingdom, but in the world. And so we must become very seed conscious, seed conscious. I think I have a message there on seed consciousness. But I feel somebody would have said, eh, Pastor, you know, we're in the age of grace. Uh, this thing doesn't work. We're in the age of grace. It doesn't matter. The seeds that I sow. Because there's a lot of grace messages jumping around town now that is feeding the irresponsibility of people. So in this second teaching, I want to use the life of the apostle of grace himself, the person who gave us the grace message, the person who God used to give us the grace message. I want to see the impact on grace on his harvest. The impact of grace on his harvest. We we'll begin with a man called Saul, and who eventually became Paul. Begin with his story from Acts chapter seven, verse fifty-seven. To verse 58, where he was there consenting to the murder of uh, uh, Stephen. Come see something. So at the end of Stephen's discourse, the Bible says, they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So we see here is a picture, the first mention of that man called Saul, who eventually became Paul, the apostle of grace. Now, how did this principle of seed time harvest play out in his life? In Acts chapter 8, verse 1, we see that Paul was a fanatic. A fanatic. And he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. In Acts 8, verse 1 to verse 4, we see the Bible says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. There's a message there. And devout men, apostles of the Japa, 
Do you get my point? I don't mean that in that sense, but I mean basically that apostles are sent. You know, if you're, if you're apostolic, you don't leave the territory because the condition of the territory is bad. You leave the territory because you're sent. Are you there? They don't. They don't leave because they say the place is bad. They leave because they are sent. Are you getting one of them? So, all right. So. So development carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, please notice in your Bible, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging out the men and the women and committing them to prison. Mm -hmm. you know Paul and prison let's continue therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word of God now you see here Paul's ministry was wrecking havoc in the church he entered every house he was dragging men and women off and committing them to prison in his zeal and his fanatism for the Lord of course by Acts chapter 9 he was on that mission and, and, and then God arrested him. Hallelujah. I'd like you to notice, ladies and gentlemen, that when Paul now received his commission, this is the apostle of grace, received his commission. His ministry, listen to me, before he came to Christ was a ministry of suffering the followers of Christ. Did you see that? Now come and see the contents of his call. In Acts chapter 9, Verse 15, when Ananias was complaining about Paul, look at what God said. But the Lord said, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of God, or of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Ah, suffering was his ministry. He, he sold suffering into the early church. Now, when he came out and received his calling, the suffering he invested in the early church was part, was now part and parcel of his apostolic ministry. In fact, he was saying, I will show him how many things he will suffer. Listen to me. He had been saved, but he could not escape his seeds. He had been saved, but he could not escape. Oh, listen. No apostle suffered like him. None. You know why? He sold suffering. God I sense was here. His New Testament, his era of grace. Oh, be careful. He sold it. And then when he came into Christ, part of his commission was to suffer. He sowed suffering. Part of his commission was to reap the suffering that he had sown. In, please follow me here. Into the church. So I will show him. God said, I will show, God said, I will show him how many things he must suffer. For my name's sake. In Acts chapter 20, verse 22 to verse 24. Paul was not speaking by himself. That was Ananias testifying. Look at Paul's testimony. Paul said, And see now, I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies that in every city, saying that chains and tribulations Await me. Okay, the question is, what did he sow? He sowed chains. He sowed tribulations. Now he was born again, and God now said to him, I'm telling you now that the Spirit was signifying that in every city, chains and tribulations await him. The apostle of grace. But none of these things in us had moved me, nor do I count my life dear to myself 
so that I may finish the race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord to testify the gospel of grace. So the one who was called to testify the gospel of grace had suffering packaged. Are you there? Because he had already sown that. For as long as he had remained, seed time and harvest shall not cease. So in spite of the fact that he was going to be in grace, God was going to give him grace. Well, that was his message. But he still experienced it in a measure. When you now move to 2 Corinthians 11 verse 22 to 23, 33, Paul was speaking about his ministry. Paul said, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Because he was about to boast. He said, only fools boast. He said, I speak as a fool now. I am more. In labors, he said, I'm more abundant. In stripes. Did you see that? In what? Stripes above measure. That's what he sold. In prisons, more frequently. That's what he sold. In deaths, often. That's what he sold. He said, for the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. See, see, see. That is five times in his life. This guy received 39 strokes. Now, 39 times, so I saw the that. No other apostle had that testimony. He sold it, but he ripped it. Five times. So, once you do the mass, I want to know 39 times five. Are you there? Almost, that's about maybe some more than 50 strokes. Five times. He says, three times I was beaten with rods. He said, once I was stoned. He said, three times, this is the apostle of grace. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I had been in the deep. In journeys often. In the perils of water. In the perils of robbers. In the perils of my countrymen. In the perils of Gentiles. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and toil. In sleeplessness often. In hunger and thirst. In fastings often. It's interesting that he distinguishes between fastings and hunger because Hunger meant there was nothing to eat. Fasting was he was fasting. Hunger was that he wanted to eat, but there was nothing to eat. In hunger, in thirst, in fastings often, in cold, in nakedness, besides the other things which come upon me daily, my care or my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Who is made to stumble and I do not bond with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. He said, the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascus with a garrison, desiring to arrest me. But I was let down in a basket. Imagine letting down an adult in a basket through the window in the wall and I escaped from his hands. Ladies and gentlemen, if the apostle of grace could not be spared from the harvest of his seeds, let's start crying out for mercy. Let's start crying out for mercy. So you have to say, oh, I'm you know, a lot of things are here. A lot of things that license, shall we continue in sin that may grace me abound? Sometimes, let me explain. Part of my calling, for instance, today as a leader is suffering. And because not, I mean, I had my fair share. <laughs> Gone through stuff. I've had to fight by the mercy and grace of God for every inch of what I have. But my past self, no easy. You get my point. Are you getting what I'm saying? 
So you have to, therefore, if, if really, as long as you see, don't say seed. Grace, therefore, does not mean I should be irresponsible or irrational or indiscriminate or careless or insensitive to the kind of seeds that I'm sowing. The apostle of grace was not spared. He preached it, but it was not spared. He lived it, but it was not spared. <laughs> May the mercy of God prevail over every one of us. Back to where I started, in Genesis 8 verse 22, he says, as long as he ever remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. You also must also, we must become most very seed conscious. We must begin to become very intentional. You're breaking somebody's home, you want to have your own. You're destroying somebody's life, you want your own to be made. You're pulling down institutions, you want your own institutions. Are you getting what I'm saying? You're rebellious to people, you want the faithfulness of people. When you are confronted about people, when you're confronted, you change loyalties and you expect people to be loyal. I See, I'm a very observant person. This principle is powerful. 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 It's called the law of conformity to type. And as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Of course, there's some positive sides of this. It means, therefore, that I have to really begin to deal with the negatives I'm sowing and to amplify the sowing of the positives. I have to begin to... I have to begin to be careful about the negative seeds I'm sowing. I have to begin to amplify the positive seeds I'm sowing. Now, this principle is a principle even God could not break. Because in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My God wanted sons, he gave his son. In Hebrews 2, verse 9, verse 10, says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone, and in bringing, he said, for it was, it was fitting for him, for whom we are, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of the salvation perfect through suffering. So God wanted sons. What did he do? He do. He sold his son. In bringing many sons to glory, he made his own son the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering so even god had to operate by this particular principle in bringing many sons to glory he had to make his own son the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering he sold his son he sold his son so even jesus even god lived by this principle and then, so you see that all through scripture is there, all through scripture. We must, ladies and gentlemen, begin to be more conscious of the kind of seeds that we're sowing. Of course, very popular scripture, Luke 6, verse 38, but we always jump verse 37. In verse 37, we say, judge not so that you will not be judged, or don't sow judgment so that you will be judged. Two condemn not and you shall not be condemned forgive and you shall be forgiven give so we always pick it from we always use that scripture for offering but it's beyond that the offering there is not uh, the scripture there is not particularly about offering as well it's not it is involved in offerings but it's not exclusive he's saying here if you sow judgment you will reap judgment if you sow condemnation, you will reap condemnation. If you sow forgiveness, you will reap forgiveness. If you give, whatever you give will be given back to you. Good measure. Press down. Shaken together. Running over. Will be put into your bosom. For with the measure again with which you give, it will be measured back to you. This is so powerful. 
He's saying the measure of judgment you give is the measure of judgment of combat. The measure of condemnation you give is the measure of condemnation of combat. The measure of forgiveness you give is the measure of forgiveness of combat. The measure of giving it works. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we all must be conscious of our seeds. If you don't want it, don't sow it. Are you getting what I'm saying here? If you don't want it, don't sow it. If you want it, sow it. If you don't want it, don't sow it. If you don't want it, don't sow it. If you don't want it, don't sow it. it. It's as simple as that. That as long as this it remains, seed time harvest. And when we talk about seeds, everything can be a seed. Prayer is a seed. Your thought is a seed. Your imagination is a seed. Your attitude is a seed. Your action is a seed. Your words are seeds. Your behavior is a seed. Your money is a seed. Your life is a seed. There's a book I have in my library, The Seed in the Ground of the Founder of Redeemed Christ. Everything about you is a seed. You are a seed. Your association is a seed. Your conversation is a seed. Everything is a seed. Now, once you begin to, once this principle begins to take over your consciousness, instantly it begins to regulate your conduct. If you don't want it, don't say, I'm very, I'm very deliberate. The type I don't want, I don't leave it. Unfortunately, many people keep sowing the wrong seeds and they're expecting the right harvest. It's not going to work like that. Sometimes we'll be having all manner of explanation. I was still talking about recently. If you have no manner of expectation, expect, ex, expectation, explanation. See, your expectation and your explanation cannot change the substance of what you are sowing. So it's not, say, it's not like that. Okay, you are sowing the right seed. Okay, repeat. And let, let's be very careful where, because if you're sowing the wrong seeds, for instance, when I, when I planted our church, I was very faithful to my pastor for about six years, pastoring this church. The benefit of sowing the right seed is that when people think they are insulting you or cursing you, they're actually indirectly blessing you. So the guy now said, a guy, one guy there, you know, I don't know where he is today, who not mind this business. The guy thought he was cursing me. He said, what you sowed into the life of Reverend Boda, you will repeat. I said a resounding amen. You can only say amen to such prayers if your seed was right. Are you getting what I'm saying? So this is it. When you're sowing the right seeds, even when people think they are cursing you, they are blessing you indirectly. So what, that, was, that was 2005, many years ago, almost how many years ago now. What you did to Reverend Ebola, you do. I mean, today, if you tell me, if I pray for you today, I say to you, what you have sown into my life, may you repeat. Will your amen be A? Eh? Or will your amen be Amen? Or will your amen be Amen, amen, amen? <laughs> so we need to be walking in our lives to the point where when they say something like that, that what you are sowing, you will reap, you can say it is only Amen. That's when you know your life is in order. But if they say what you have sown, may you reap, and you can't say Amen, that means your life needs fixing. And this month, we had better begin to fix it. You have to keep working on your life to the point where when a person thinks, when they say that what you reap, may you saw it. You will not be quiet as a hmm. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's not about the prayer. It's a principle. You know some of the principles not about prayer. If you saw it, you are you there? Uh -huh, that's how it works. So the guy, when he said, What you sowed in the love of your mother, you reap it. I said, Amen. Today I sit as a pastor over one of God's finest churches in the earth. Because there was, I was faithful to that man when I served him. I served him with all of my heart, all of my life, all of my soul. And not only that, I served him then. I'm still serving him till today. I'm still, still today. Till today. His place is still there, relevant to me. Till today. Is the type you're going to read. Therefore, we must, in my final session, begin to get our lives in order. Now, what this means is we need to therefore begin to deal with the negative seeds. And then we wipe that out and then we begin to stay on the frequency of only the positive seeds.